into my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel, if you're new and I'm a draftsman, and also the host of this show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I offer you episode 80, and I will talk with artist Phil Padway. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also by subscribing to my audio visual channel. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to support, uh, to show your support with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, which is gabriellahandle.com, just one word. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay by prints of my drawings, or you can leave me a tip. The links for all these things will be in the caption or video description. Thank you for your time and attention in watching this episode, and do leave a comment so I know you are here. I hope you enjoy it. All right, Phil Podway, welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 80. Uh, please tell our future listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Yeah, my name is Phil Padway, and uh, I am an artist located in New York City, also a graphic designer. Um, up until very recently, like a week ago, an art director. Um, and I've been teaching um, more and more uh, fine art drawing, cast drawing, life drawing, studio art. Um, and yeah, that's uh, where I'm at at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um... I'm, you know, even though I knew that you were doing graphic design, I didn't, um, cause I've been wanting to have somebody that has experience with graphic design on the, on the po podcast for a while now. So that's cool. I will ask you questions regarding that in a bit. Okay. Um, Hopefully uh, okay, I can so, answer them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you do have plenty, plentiful experience in the subject, so I'm sure you will. Um, why don't you talk to me a little bit about how you ended up as an artist? Like, uh, when did you start doing artistic things? And, oh, yeah. And, um, um, yeah, go ahead. For sure. Um, so I've always drawn. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I think most of the uh, people that I've met through our shared connection at the New York Academy of Art, especially the drawing majors, like, we're, we're lifers, right? Mm -hmm. We all um, kind of tuned into it, at, like, young and keep for some crazy reason at it today uh so yeah i started like drawing snoopy in like first grade and then um i found it was like an easier way to gain acceptance among peers than let's say like i, I wasn't like the best at sports i wasn't the uh smartest kid in class i also wasn't the best artist i was like probably the second best artist or third best artist and that always kept me hungry right like mm -hmm. i I was fortunate not to be uh, so amazingly good at anything ever that it came super easy. So uh, yeah, working at art, drawing, um, make a long story short, like adolescence was like a weird, my, 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 I was adopted at birth, which comes back like later um, in the art conversation, but um, I had always known I was adopted. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was, 10 my adopted father passed away and my mother uh and i just started butting heads when i was like 11 and by the time i was 14 i was out of the house and i was a runaway and uh, as a teenager like you keep i kept going uh they kept putting me in like worse and worse places which were more and more of like a reason to um, yeah, like residential treatment facilities and like rehabs for doing like very, like not really exaggerated drug use, like smoking pot and drinking beer at age 16. Like, um, but yeah, like, uh, and then residential treatment facilities um, and like, you know, schools where you lived all, all year round. And there was no art exposure in those places. So I was like the guy who was painting people's jean jackets or drawing on their um, on their notebooks and they, you know, I, there was like a list of, of people a mile long. And then again, it was like this kind of tool for dealing with a, a, a tough situation, but B like, I didn't have to be king shit alpha male because I mm -hmm. could draw really well and king shit alpha male left me alone. Like, it was like, oh, cool. You could draw. Hey man. Um, uh -huh. so it's always been this kind of 
um, it's always been this kind of, uh, it, it helps grease the social wheel for me, like in ways that I don't necessarily know how to be super outgoing if I don't have art in front of me. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, I basically uh, fell into graphic design and it's a different kind of art. But um, when I got graduated finally uh, from this residential treatment facility, it was like seven schools in four years. And um, when I got out of the last one, like I basically just like signed myself out and went and lived with a guitarist and I was learning how to sing. And like, we started a band and next thing I know, we're, you know, down on the Bowery in New York city. We spent like, you know, from 1993 to like 2000 um, uh, sharing a practice room and writing songs and just having the time of our lives doing um, you know, CD release parties and selling our music. And then also that led to me doing a lot of graphic design because, you know, we at first we needed somebody to lay out our CD art for us. Um, and it's crazy to me knowing how easy it is now. <laughs> like, um, you know, we had to have somebody do our do our T-shirts and like mm -hmm. and then eventually you're like, you know, wait, I, I should learn this stuff. Like I'm interested and I know I can draw. So let me, you know, let me try and poke around. Um, and then I learned the software I needed to do to learn, you know, to do our CD art, which wound up being very similar to, you know, the, actually it was the exact same at the time it was Cork. Um, the same software that they were using in, you know, name it, the, the packaging industry, the print industry. Um, and then I started doing my band's website and then other bands were like, can you do my website? Can you do my art? Can you do my t-shirts? Can you do my... And then, you know, it wasn't ever to the point where it was like a comfortable side business, but I did like a ton of logos over probably 10 years um, and a lot of CD art and layout. And then that just naturally morphed into working in marketing um, from uh, this company, Madison Direct Marketing. They were at the time in like 2003, 2005, the biggest um, direct mail marketer, which means like... Uh, it's like it was annihilated by email but like at the time you used to get these packages in the mail like an envelope with 50 offers inside like just coupons um so i went to work oh i i get you get that still yeah but there's like only one now and it used to be a competitive oh, industry and like, yeah valpac's the only one left uh, <laughs> that blue envelope right but mm -hmm. they used to at the time these guys uh i don't know if you remember but there was a time when you could not open your mailbox for like five or eight years without there being a CD from AOL. Right? It was just like ages ago, but they were the ones who were sourcing all that AOL delivery. So like they just had, they were sitting on piles of money. And um, yeah, so I, I, that was like my introduction to marketing and a white collar job. And uh, I was doing the band thing at night and, you know, trying to live in two worlds. And that's kind of been a theme uh, my whole life, like the adoption and everything. It's just like, am I of this world or that world? Um, am I uh, a gra graphic designer? Am I a fine artist? Do I want to do illustration? Do I want to, you know, and then I've realized, and I know this is kind of where eventually part of this conversation is going to go, that like, you know, not everything you draw is art, right? Mm -hmm. Like some of it is just, you're going through a mechanical process to get better at something you want to get better at. So, you know, you learn that not to be precious about uh, everything that you make. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I think that for a long time, I've been on a drawing trip, not so much an, an art trip. And I'm at a point now where it's really exciting for me because I feel like it's all coming together. Um, and I am realizing now the difference between art and design and drawing and when they it's like a Venn diagram right and they're not always going to overlap but when they do you can do some really cool stuff anyway mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was that like too crazy and sweeping an explanation of, no no uh, no that was cool that was good okay. that was good um okay so what is then the difference between art or fine art and graphic design and uh well as you just mentioned the Venn diagram of course there's overlap um where do they overlap and where do they defer? I think that like um, the, the kind of the key ingredient, especially with art, like where art is concerned versus something like graphic design, you often have an objective 
and site and you're executing against XYZ. So you have information, let's say, that has to be laid out. Like I need to tell you with this piece of paper that there's a show on Thursday night at you know, one, two, three Main Street. It's at 8 p.m. There are two other bands. And like you, how do you get all that information into something that's graphically pleasing? That's mm -hmm. not necessarily it can be art. It's one of the problems, I guess, with with art is that it's just such an all-encompassing term. And there are like, um, you know, first of all, it's not just art, it's the arts, right? Like, and they're all co-equal and they coexist. There's writing, there's uh, literature, uh, music, dance, uh, you name it. And each one of those has dozens of idioms or um, what do you call it? Uh, what's Wade's world? Uh, Wade's word. Uh, uh, modality, right? Uh, all these different modalities. So like, you know, within music, you can have rock and roll, you can have classical music, orchestral music. Within dancing, it could be break dancing or ballet dancing. Um, so uh, each one of these probably has thousands of practitioners. So I mean, when you just multiply it all out, art is being practiced by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people every day, creating new, um, you know, whatever expressions. So I think like the thing that they all have in common, and then this also ties into graphic design and, and visual art that we're kind of talking about is intention, right? Mm -hmm. So like, if you intend to make art or you don't intend to make art, I think that goes an awful long way to really defining if something is or is not art. Um, I don't think like somebody else can decide that your effort is art if you don't think it's art, but I don't think that works the other way. So I think like if somebody decide, nobody can decide that your art that you have decided is art is not, you know what I mean? It, it kind of, mm -hmm. it, uh, anyway. Um, intention, I think, is 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 a lot of it because otherwise, um, you know, how do you compare apples to oranges, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, um, it. I mean, from what I understand uh, from your explanation, it it really seems like graphic design is almost more simple in a way, because even if we limit ourselves to just visual fine art, for example. Uh, the kind of stuff that we try to talk about in quotes when it comes to making an, a visual, you know, a drawing or a painting, it's, I mean, it's kind of fleshed out in a way because, you know, I like, for example, in my case, like I still want to depict the figure, for example, but the meaning that I derive from then working on the drawing and like the way that it feels and the stuff that I'm thinking about while I'm making the drawing and, you know, it becomes really very layered and not, not, not necessarily scattered in the sense that it kind of loses, you know, I kind of get lost in the, in the branches or like the weeds when I'm thinking about the work and then I am unable, completely unable to explain it to somebody when I want to talk about it. But it's definitely more complex, I guess compared to what I understand from what you were saying about graphic design, because it's like uh, the goal of graphic design, of, of a graphic design um, job, I guess, right, um, is straightforward and like the way that you were saying, I guess it's kind of similar in a way to illustration because, um, and I guess you can tell me if there's that overlap between graphic design and illustration that it's like, for example, if I'm trying to illustrate the cover of a book, it's like I'm trying to specifically talk about what is happening or something about what happens in the book. So like that's really straightforward. Yeah. Um, obviously with its own difficulties or whatever, but really straightforward. And then that's the goal. I want to depict this phrase or something or like this scene. This and moment. similarly similarly with uh with graphic design, it's like, yeah, I want to sell these computers and I want it to look this way. I want this color scheme uh, at this store. You know, yeah. So, so what do you think about? Oh, what do you think about that? And uh, tell me in that case um, also about the relationship or like the comparison, I guess, between graphic design and illustration. Um, you can still hear me, right? Because I just got a. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think that graphic design and illustration are first cousins. Like they're um, they're as close as you can get without being like let's call it siblings, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I 
have like a genuine passion for both that equals my passion for making fine art, which is kind of why I've been in this conundrum because uh, I think that there's expectations to kind of choose one bed and finally lay in it. And I've been, just, I, you know, decades now, I can't choose. Um, You're just and, promiscuous. Yeah, I did. Well, I did. It's just kind of like, I love them both equally. And mm -hmm. they're, um, so, yes, I do think that there's a, a, a correlation. And I think that both are in a way easier because you know when you've succeeded. You know, like the job is done either when you've spent X amount of time, like whatever your negotiation was up front, you're going to do five versions or you're going to give them uh, 10 choices or you're going to do, um, you know, what, what, whatever it is that you agree upon up front. When that is over, you know it's done. Whereas with a drawing, like that is you're consciously taking, you know, like you're saying, you spend that time and it becomes something else. And like whatever that initial impetus can often change over the course of the creation of a piece of art. And um, I think that um, you don't always know when that's done. You know, Leonardo famously said that uh, no art, no work of art is ever finished, just abandoned, right? Mm -hmm. So like that comes into play when you reach a certain level of technical, uh, let's call it finesse or ability. Um, you know, when I, when I'm doing a simple line sketch in my sketchbook i'm not concerned with the, the the same criteria i'm concerned with when i'm sitting down to do a fine silver point drawing of a subject that's going to take me a week or two weeks um and i know what you mean there is like totally this meditative almost trance like um especially for me when i'm oh, i'm getting a phone call hold on i'm just gonna decline this um uh Sorry, it just totally broke my train of thought for a second there. Um, uh, the trance-like? Yeah, when... right. I, I just broke out of my trance-like state. Right. So mm -hmm. um, when I'm especially doing like a silver point, which is something that like it's a medium I love to use because it really slows me down. Um, and by nature, I'm just like a frenetically fast sketcher. And like this really, even if I go super fast, as long as I don't go super hard, I have all the time in the world to kind of figure out where I'm going and get back and circle around. Um, so yeah, there is this just calming and really enjoyable kind of, you, like you said, like you can't really explain it because it's a truly right brain phenomenon. Whereas like left brain is uh, speech and, you know, explanation and understanding. Um, and I think that, you know, really at the crux of a lot of this is this left brain, right brain relationship, you know, um, and it's hard to uh, to do the. It's almost impossible to do the two at once to like, have you I, I, I've had a lot of classes with a lot of instructors at this point over the last five years. Um, and it is a super rare trait to see somebody who can really fully immerse themselves in right brain, like be actively drawing, finding the marks and then explaining it at the same time. Like, in fact, I only know one person who can do it flawlessly and that's Dan? Michael Grimaldi. No, oh. Mike. I, I was going to say Dan Thompson. Well, Dan Thompson also can do it, but I've only been in Dan's, I, I did a workshop with Dan. I didn't get a chance to take like any, you know, uh, classes at the academy with him. Um, but yeah, Dan is another one. So like Dan and Michael, and I mean, I, they are truly like they are the draftsmen's draftsmen, you know, like they are the the drawing people's drawing people. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And they are. Yeah, they're they're I've talked to both, by the way, for the podcast. Just nice. Saying. All right. Well, I, I saw Michael's. <laughs> I, I I went to I was like, all right, let me I got to watch one of these to see what I'm in for. Um, <laughs> so that one's good. His is good. His is very good. You, um, yeah. I mean, not surprising. So. Yeah, um, uh, I've never exited that kind of meditative state from a silver point drawing and thought to myself like, ooh, now I'm like raging angry. Like it just, it doesn't happen. It's the opposite, mm -hmm. it slows you down and it calms you. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that that's, I don't encounter that feeling in uh, maybe in an illustration, if I know what I'm doing, like I can kind of get into the drawing. It is still drawing illustration ultimately, but yeah, I never feel that kind of sense of calm. Like I'm just 
chipping away at something that needs to exist and I'm the I'm gonna bring it into the okay. world with graphic. Uh, I wanna interrupt you. I wanna interrupt you because yeah. um this I mean illustration if you're making an illustration for a book and graphic design if you're making graphic yeah. design uh, for you know somebody hired you uh reminds me actually now that I hear you talking about it. I mean I already knew that but um you know when when you're talking about it and especially what you said about not being able to get into the drawing like the calm sort of feeling that you get uh when you're making your own work reminds me of commissioned work um yeah. because you know that also has like the specific goal of depicting something for someone else which arguably are tra i mean are traits that are very present in both graphic design and illustration and um why is it that, why do you think that you can't get into the calmness that you can get into? You know, you can't get into the calm feeling when you're making graphic design illustration or a commissioned work, but you can when you're making fine art. It's a, it's like, why is that difference? It's like, I can tell you I, why for me, but you know. Yeah, I, I think the part of it is definitely, um, you feel your way into a drawing. Um, so much of what I'm trying to capture in a drawing of my own is how I feel about the subject. Um, so uh, I'm doing the opposite in an illustration. I'm trying to take my feelings completely out of it. I'm not, uh, my feelings shouldn't be dictating uh, what is or is not compositionally a sound design, right? Like feelings and composition you can use composition to augment your feelings and you can use colors and things like that. And you can, you know, really punch home um, certain emotions. But that said, uh, you're almost being paid to remove yourself and just to think about it intellectually and to do what's required. So, yeah, I think that um, keeping my mind on doing what's necessary and required and appropriate and right is just puts me in a different mindset than like, hey man, I love the way this feels, and I'm gonna make. Oh yeah, this is starting to look really cool. I'm gonna work on the eyes. I'm, ooh, I'm gonna uh -huh. work. You know. <laughs> okay, but then does that mean that there is no intellectuality in fine art? No, it means that you just apply your intellect in a different way when you're mm -hmm. kind of putting it forefront versus letting your subconscious come to the forefront. So like, you can't really let your subconscious dictate graphic design whereas you can absolutely let your subconscious dictate your drawings um okay. so i mean you could do you could create something and then put it to use in graphic design right um but yeah to me it's just it, it's you know like if i'm doing a bunch of logos for like the last thing i had i was working in the cannabis industry doing a bunch of strain logos and packaging designs and i enjoyed the hell out of it i loved it it was fun but um, at no point was I ever able to turn off my brain and stop myself from thinking like, this is for an intended audience, um, not myself. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's to me, the difference is like, I'm not thinking of necessarily an intended audience when I'm drawing something that I just want to make look as quote unquote cool to me as I possibly can. Um, mm -hmm. I it, it's it's the audience it's the intention of who sees it and what it's going to be used for for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, what is it for you uh well I haven't done graphic design well I guess one could argue that I have because I have totally made logos for things and yeah, tattoos and, yeah and, and yeah and tattoo designs and commissioned work of like portrait stuff for for people right so I guess there's you know there you know, you could say that there's some of that. Um, and for me, it's just always very stressful because um, because now the work doesn't only have to please me, it has to please another person. Right, yeah. And, and, um, and like, for me, it's a lot of pressure because, I mean, if I make commission work, I charge half first. It's like I don't start unless I've been paid half already, for example. Right. Um, and it's like, all right, so like, you know, that commitment where money is involved, it's like, all right, you, it's like, I have to do the thing. Uh, like that sense of responsibility that I can't abandon the work. It's like, oh, I can't work on another thing while I'm working on this thing. I have to finish. 
Right. Um, you know, I find that incredibly stressful and not, I mean, not, not, I mean, stressful, yes, but other things as well, just like the kind of having to necessarily have the approval of the person who's paying me because they're paying me. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not crazy about it, even yeah, though, no, of it's... course, there's good money in that, you know, and uh, I yeah, like it... money. So, yeah, it's, I want I'm the money. <laughs> as I start, I started looking for like just teaching jobs. And like, you know, they pay per credit at the universities here in New York City. And I was like, oh, my God, like they don't pay very well at all. Like it's like it you make in a semester what you would make in a month. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's jarring. And I'm absolutely yes, 100 percent. You're preaching to the choir. There's money. And it's uh, it's a it's a kind of a yucky feeling, though. Right. It's like, oh, I'm doing this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> lots of people, I think, you know, lots of people, and I, I don't actually care for that. And I'm, among other things, I'm working on changing my relationship with money to like remove that whole, oh, Marxist capitalist uh, kind of tarnish that alleges yes, that money makes things dirty or whatever, or like in the case, and in the case of art, that it kind of removes the artistry or the genuine feeling from the art. It's like, I don't like that. I think it's really grossly inaccurate. And not to yeah. mention it's, it's Marxist, which is like, I don't want anything to do with that. Right. Um, I think it's uh, just very flawed uh, in general. And um, so, you know, I don't, I don't want to have that pollution kind of when I'm considering, because, because it's like, you know, if even, even if I'm not making a drawing for someone else, it's like, I still want to, you know, either show the work um maybe have it in a gallery i still want people to purchase the work you know yeah. and i and i don't think i don't think that removes the legitimacy of the intention like you were saying in any capacity it's like absolutely not yeah you know because it's like at least in the in the realm of making my own of my own personal work it's like i'm pretty unwilling to compromise in lots of things so it's like you know i still want to get paid for the for the drawing it's like i still want people to buy the drawing but then it's like in the process of making the drawing, I'm not interested in making it look a certain way or like for the videos for YouTube, for example, which is tangentially related. It's like, I'm yeah. not interested in making the, like the caps lock titles, for example, and I'm not interest, interested in making the thumbnails with the exaggerated facial expression or like right. the, or like the clickbait titles, for example. It's like, I fucking refuse to do that because I find it to be such a joke. <laughs> it's like so absurd. I mean, that's tangential, but it's like, it's kind of like that. You know, what do you think about that? In terms um, of, you know, art and I graphic design and illustration. At... Yeah. Um, so I am awful at the whole Instagram thing. Like I've slowly been building a very awesome, very loyal, um, very friendly crowd. I'm not at the numbers that everyone else is. I'm a, a lowly 5,000. But like I'm, again, I it's taken forever because I don't do the things that you're saying. I don't do like a lot of um i don't do any of the things that i was told by my friend who's very good at it and mm -hmm. she constantly every time i see i you know dina brodsky yeah yeah every time i see dina dina's like you don't do any of the things i tell you and that's why your instagram is stuck and she's right i don't do any of the things that she suggests isn't she like almost Instagram at a million um Oh, between, yes, she is uh, between, and she's got like a couple of other sites that she manages yeah. and runs. And if you could, you know, total them up. Yeah, easily, easily. Um, she really knows this stuff, which is, you know, um, and she teaches it. So, hey, plug, uh, if anyone right. wants to learn this Instagram for artist stuff, Dina Brodsky is offering to teach you how. Unfortunately, I can't seem to learn it or put it into practice. So, um, yeah, I just want to, like you said, kind of, I want to do my thing. I want to post my drawings or my stupid studio videos of me, you know. Um, anyway, I realized that uh, I didn't get into how I got into fine art, which was basically um, just to go back a second in the storytelling of like uh, how I got from A to B. Mm -hmm. um, like, 12, 15 years ago, I took a night job at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. So um, it was like the, you know, around sunset to around midnight. 
um, is the shift. It's not the overnight. Like it wasn't the midnight till like eight in the morning. Um, so I, you know, I had just written and illustrated my first children's book. I did mommy has a tattoo and, um, and you know, I have tattoos and it was like a no brainer there. It didn't exist. This was 15 years ago. And, um, I, yeah. And I also did the tattoo coloring book number one, like before the adult coloring book craze. So, uh, I needed to basically have some sort of insurance. I wasn't married yet. And, uh, I needed a job just to pay the bills. So I took this night job and, you know, I was at the Met five days a week for eight hours, seven of which the museum was closed. So I'm like walking around this place, just leading around contractors, you know, for five or six hours. And then you have like two full hours to kind of, I, I shouldn't say this, but like you wind up with a couple of hours to yourself if, if, if you do it right. <laughs> um, so yeah, that like we, cool. you know, I would go into the galleries with, it was amazing. So like, I, you know, I, I would always keep a sketchbook. I filled 20 sketchbooks. I did almost a thousand drawings. It was like 880 something in three and a half years. Um, I, we knew where the lights were. I would go into a gallery at like 11 o'clock at night, turn on the lights, sketch for a half an hour, turn off the lights, go back downstairs. Um, you know, you have chiefs is what they call them. And you're, they're, my chiefs were all really cool and they would give me sit down posts if there was a show coming or going um and i would just sit there and like draw the milkmaid for five hours or draw um you know michelangelo had an exhibition and i got to sit there and draw this you know copy his drawings it was the best job i've ever had but that of course was like fuck i need to be an artist this like mm -hmm. illustration what children's books that's that's not art. What was I thinking? That's, you know, yeah. so I had also just like kind of banged out this children's book really quickly. And I was kind of ashamed of the art. Like it's not fine art. It's like a cartoon style. Um, it did very well. It was called like a hipster classic. Four years mm -hmm. later, I did daddy has a tattoo and then tattoo color book number two. Um, so it had some legs and it was well received, but um, the Met just changed everything and I got married when I left the Met and then yeah we moved to London and oh before I did the Met guards had a show of our art um mm -hmm. at a gallery on Central Park West nice. and, yeah and it got written up in the New York Times I I was in like on New York one I had a drawing of Edgar Allan Poe a little portrait in the New York Times print edition um and it was like oh wow like it's easy anyone could be an artist like it was this total misconception of what was ahead of me um so yeah that was like kind of my introduction to like okay I, I'm like uh I think I can do this I think I could be an artist I had such a positive reception at first um and then obviously you know that's not that's not the way New York City or the art world or anything works and it was a great splash um but it was yeah 15 years ago um and then we lived in london for two years and i basically spent the second I, I was freelancing and i was really busy the first year and then like that second year i was just out of sight out of mind too long and my clients started drying up i had like two out of 11 um so i, I started going to the british museum and i spent like a about a year going three times a week two times a week um, and copying all the old master drawings in their prints and drawing section, which was like, uh, the British have the most insane collection of old master drawings. It's um, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Van Dyke, Rubens, uh, Durer. I, I was like a pig in shit. Um, and mm -hmm. that's really where I learned to draw, like really learned. So I had done like 20 sketchbooks at the Met. And then I went to the British Museum and we were, you know, kind of, my wife is into food. Um, and fortunately, the cities in Europe with the best restaurants are the cities with the best museums. So oh, nice. we just kept going for her or for me, I can't say, right? Like, but we were very happy, both of us and, you know, in our, in our travels for two years. And then, yeah, I came back and I um, started for the first time actually taking classes. I was in my mm -hmm. 40s at the Art Students League. And I studied with uh, this guy Costa and Rick Brosen and Frederick Brosen has become a friend since, but he was like, listen, you got to go downtown to this school called the New York Academy of Art. Uh, you can already draw, like you're going to have such a great time. You're going to learn 
things that you didn't know. You're going to meet people who are going to have conversations that'll blow your mind. I was like, what is New York Academy of what now? And uh, yeah, like here we are. So um, I did. I met people and I had conversations and they blew my mind. Mostly Wade Schumann, really good guy who you know well. He, Um, yeah, Wade is awesome. He is. I I met you in Wade's class, actually. Yeah, Um, that's right. And you were, I oh, just to give credit where credit is due. Um, and then I had a full circle moment like that. Before I ever heard of New York Academy of Art, I was following you on Instagram and I knew your oh. work. First thing I saw was your, like the self-portrait as like a Cenobite, the pinhead thing. And I was like, that's oh. so fucking cool. Um, and, it, and like, yeah, just total fanboy was like, this is amazing. I love this artist. I'm going to follow this artist. Um, and then, of course, when I walked into my drawing, whatever that was, drawing two class, I was like, oh, my God, I I follow you on Instagram. That's so That's so really cool. cool. I had the same thing happen. My my second year, there was like a first year who was like, oh, oh my God, I've been following you for years before I ever. And I was like, oh, this is my Gabriella moment. Like, I'm totally having a <laughs> full, full circle moment. So, yeah, it was cool. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm I'm particularly pleased that the first thing you saw of my work was that drawing uh, as a Cenobite. It was um, really cool. Yes. I mean to finish that because uh, it's still in progress. And uh, But anyway, yes, that's really cool. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me know because that's awesome. And okay, yeah. okay, so we, we have to talk about other things. Um, all right, so Mr. Mr. Padway, what is art in your opinion? Um... You know, I'm going to circle back to what I was saying before, which is, I think, if you try and make a Venn diagram, right, of what do all the arts have in common? Um, Intention, I think. Uh, So art is um, is something that kind of takes you outside of your own head, I think, Um, removes you, whether for a split second or reliably over time, you can go back to something again and again. it just takes you away from your own conscious narrative in your head about yourself and what you're seeing. Uh, and it either um, kind of just reminds you that there's a world bigger or other um, than yours. And uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I've, I've also found art to be like the application of rhythm in a way that I, I can't understand well enough to explain. But like if when I when I was writing songs and like performing on a stage, like the rhythm in a in that moment and the rhythm when your hand gets going and the rhythm when your body starts rocking to the music that you're listening to while you're painting or you're drawing or you're like rhythm, uh, which in in, a, in an essence is some kind of math. Um, is at the core, is at the heart of this. And it's like this kind of uh, subconscious representation of universally true mathematics in the form of, you know, your strokes on the paper, especially like hatching is all about rhythm. Like if somebody's rhythm goes off in their hatching and all of a sudden it starts looking stuttered and start stop, like it really, it breaks that fictional dream of what you're looking at. So yeah, I think, I think art is like, uh, Art is, art is something that is either intentionally made or, well, yeah, I think it has to be intentionally made. I don't think that true art is like accidental. Like you can have happy accidents in your art making and they can be beautiful and they can even, you know, um, wind up making most of that work, right? Like 80% of a drawing, let's say. But um, I, I do think that intention is important and that, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll um, leave it at that. Huh? What? I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, I'm not going to let you leave it at that because I have more oh, no. questions. <laughs> um, so I want you to go more into this intention part. What does that mean exactly? What does making art intentionally mean? Um, I mean, in your, you know, in, so, in what you're talking about in your definition of art. I think that like, um, it, even that, all right, so let's say everyone right now is kind of up in arms about AI um, and even AI, which is like machine for the most part, it's like machine created art, right? It's imagery that's manufactured electronically. Um, Even AI art requires like a prompt, an intention, uh, an intentional 
uh, human thought, um, which is why I don't really think that we can, like there's paintings by elephants of flowers, right? Like we've all seen those on YouTube and uh, until, until we found out that they were like actually not being well treated. I thought those were like the coolest things. Um, but that's not really art. That's like like a gimmicky elephant thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think like human intention, I want to create something. I want to make something. I want to, you know, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it's successful. There's good art and there's successful art and there's, you know, technically proficient art and there's sloppy art. And then, you know, there's all kinds of art. But um, I think what they share in common is that somebody intended to make some art. Um, does that better explain what I mean by the intention part? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so then in that case, it's... deliberately choosing to make something in a specific way? Kind of, yeah. Like, so that's um that's kind of like the definition of uh like you know they they say that we're going to learn discourse at the new york academy of art and i did and it's mainly just that word again modality that i picked mm -hmm. up from wade which is like the specific way of doing something like that's what it mm -hmm. means like a modality is um um the specific mode or way or manner um of proceeding um so yeah i think that like um independent of modality intention is like the core ingredient in most art making that said i don't think it necessarily again means that it's good art like you know um uh there's that guy who you know piss christ um is yeah exactly it's like conceptual art um i think unfortunately since um who was it marcel duchamp right like kind of introduced the, the toilet as art he kind of commoditized outrage as a form of artistic expression and there's been a bunch of you know people for better or worse in the wings like constantly trying to push that right like how can i make people just pissed off and call something art um and that's unfortunately part of art 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 can be a parody of itself you know like there's like um, one of the, the, it, it got me thinking, this was years ago, and I don't know what they're doing now, but, um, there was like a stencil spray paint artist that was putting up, this is not art, um, all over the place. And I would see it and I would think to myself like, God damn, that looks like art because it's telling me it's not art. And it's got me mm -hmm. thinking about art in this moment that should be divorced from art, but now all of a sudden art is introduced and like, anyway, so yeah, I think art um even when it's a parody of art can be art but art when it's just not intended to be something meaningful is not art so yeah i'm annoyed i roll my eyes i get angry <laughs> at some of what's considered art um because like yourself i adore technical skill and like i myself have spent well over 15 years now drawing every single day trying to hone that skill um so you know um a big part of like you know so i said i would circle back with that whole my being adopted um a big part of like i found my whole family right before i started at the academy um and the you know the mother's side was great they're in Ireland. They're all Irish. I have cousins who are amazing. Um, I have a three-year-old goddaughter who's the cutest little thing, all because of this, like, you know, finding them. And um, it's been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And then there's the father's side, which was like literally right before school, two months before school. I met him and I have a, I, it turns out I was conceived um, the day his daughter was born. So I have a half sister who's nine months and three days older than me. Um, but like he, this guy is like a real piece of shit and he cheated on his wife. So like while his wife was in the hospital with a brand new baby girl, he went and knocked up the nurse um, at the hospital. And that that's how I came into the world. So in it was- the hospital? At in the, the hospital, hospital where your mom was giving, uh, what the, where the, your half sister's mom was giving birth like simultaneously? like correct like he he wow went that's like he, talented that's like talent 
That's, but it's awful at the same time. I mean, it's a great- sure, Of course it's awful, but it's like, that requires talent. Yeah, that's persuasive. Wow. That dude was persuasive. That's like some movie thing. All right, never mind. Go, go on, no, I'm sorry. No, but I mean, yeah, he went around the hallways basically going like, I just had a baby girl. Who's going to go dancing with me? I want to go dancing. Come on, come on, come on. And then he found the one who had been, she'd been a nun for 17 years until the year before. And long story short, she was meant to be married to the chief of surgery at that hospital, but he was shot and killed um, when these home invaders came to take his prescription pad is the long story short. So what I learned in this story, though, which is crazy pants to me, is that um, so I've been like anti-gun anti-murder like most of us i think are i'm not like the most uh anyway i wouldn't exist if this woman's fiance hadn't been shot and killed so i uh in a hunt for his prescription pad so at this intersection um granted it was like 1971 but like in the intersection of um gun violence and uh opioid epidemic um she gets cast into her wacky world where she winds up with this man. Um, I'm just like all these wrongs. So I'm not, I'm trying to figure out, like I'm not supposed to be judgmental, I think is what the universe is trying to tell me. I shouldn't exist except for this awful person cheating, for this poor woman losing her fiance in an awful home invasion. Um, so maybe, maybe I should be less judgmental about everything maybe maybe two wrongs do make a right maybe three wrongs make a right i don't know but like so yeah i am trying to take what i've learned about like this very humbling like oh my god i'm the product of this like that's crazy um and apply that to my art right now which is like something that was too tall in order going into grad school like i felt like somebody cracked my head open and just like poured rocks into it right before I started at the academy and where I've wound up though is like okay whatever I thought I knew I don't know everything is okay I accept everything and everyone and you know past present future like um yeah um so art is like life itself like uh just this massive huge net that is very difficult to um define but uh yeah i i'm i'm all for piss christ or uh any other kind of questionable yeah exactly any other I'm not, uh, i don't i don't consider that art and i also don't consider the the urinal art i don't consider it good art i i mean i don't consider it art at all um, because it's different it, it is it is different but I mean, what they're trying to do is get us to basically have a conversation exactly like this. So to an extent, I think, you know, they've already succeeded just by virtue of the fact we're talking about it, right? Like, which is infuriating. But um, yeah, I can't deny that it's, you know. Um, well, I'm not sure whether they necessarily succeeded I mean, I can grant something in the case of uh, Duchamp because he was trying to rebel against something. Like, I don't remember what it was now. Um, and he wasn't even necessarily trying to rebel as a, against an establishment. He was actually testing his own Dadaist people um, who were the ones, you know, they were claiming that anything was art. And it's like, in this show, you can submit anything and everything. There's no limit. So then he goes and submits a urinal and then they got pissed off. Um, and so... I feel um I I I think that's a different kind of test. Um but and I don't think it's necessarily against art, but then the result of that and the impression that it gave to onlookers and other artists and all of this stuff is that oh my god, shocking. It's like so it's like, you know, they're gonna talk about this forever and stuff. And so like everything after that is just about reproducing what he did. And it's like that was it's like when something surprises you or scares you or, the, or you know, if you watch the movies, the jump scare, the really yeah. shitty, scary movies are just full of jump scares and they're not, they don't have any kind of a good story Yeah, because it's cheap. It's cheap and it's only going to scare you the one time. And so like the same with this whole thing about shocking, 
It's like the only one that was really shocking was Duchamp with his urinal. And then everyone after was just trying to copy him. Yeah, it's terrible. And so like, the, and so like, and so like, and so like the, the, the basis of everything that comes afterwards and the value of it is just trying, it's like not just, so like every work of art that tries to reproduce that depends on the existence of the urinal on the yep. story of the urinal and knowing about the urinal. So it stops being a visual work of art. And so like, I recently learned this, that the value of a visual work of art, when you're looking at it, is that you can look at it and you don't have to know what art is. You don't have to know the artist. You don't know what it, you don't have to know what it means. You don't have to know what material was used. You don't have to know any of that. And if the work cannot stand on its own, unless you know, oh, circumstances and context and history and the artist right. and what it means according to the artist, that is probably not a work of art. And if it is, it's very flawed. It has a problem. So then because the value of the piss Christ is underpinned in Duchamp's um, existence and right. what he did and in pissing you off and, and on being as disrespectful as just whatever he could think of as really like offensive and ooh, edgy, you know, it's like under underpinned and being edgy. It's like, I think if it, if it is a work of art, it's like, it's like, if I admit that it's a work of art, it is a shitty as hell work of art. Yes. It's like, yeah. it's like yeah. to the point, it's like to the point where it's like, as far as I'm concerned, that is not art because it's like you, of course you have good art and bad art, but then there are things that are not art. And it's like, that art. is not art. You yeah. Know? Yeah. No, I mean, the, the whole, like, that's kind of uh, the thornier side of the whole conceptual art movement is like a lot of it drives you crazy if, if you let it. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't drive me crazy because it's a lot of it is just not art. <laughs> yeah. As I, far I, as I'm concerned. I'm the last person who's going to like actually dig in and argue that, oh, no, no, wait, that is art. But I just, I feel, Again, like I am one who's paid my dues and continues to pay my dues. Um, and I think that like, you know, uh, your actions speak louder than words, right? So um, technically proficient draftsmanship speaks for itself. And that to me is the most attractive thing in art. Um, even like, you know, uh, painterly paintings, they need for me some sort of underpinning in a realistic draftsman uh you know drawing there needs to be something underneath that some framework some um construction um that yeah that has to do with a well-conceived drawing uh for it to be a successful beautiful piece of art also to what you were saying yeah you shouldn't need to have a whole narrative or know a history of something to appreciate it and i had um uh somebody say um that great and it just stuck with me great art well, I think good art too, but definitely great art rewards you for looking, right? Like you you might notice something initially that grabs your attention, but then you notice a second thing when you really stop and pay attention and then maybe a third thing and a fourth thing. And it just, the longer you stay with it, the more you are rewarded for your having looked at it more mm -hmm. intently. Um, and that is, I think, something that every piece of that kind of you know relies on the Duchamp toilet to exist art misses it misses by huge margins like there's no soul. it doesn't have it by default no it's like the opposite it, it like by default doesn't have it and challenges you because it doesn't have it and like that at some point you're right is no longer a challenge like it's just kind of like okay we get it <laughs> mm -hmm. now show me your skill um but yeah mm -hmm. not every unfortunately not all um art is skill based although it would be nice right if if all singers were good singers and all guitarists were good guitarists and all visual artists were good visual artists you mm -hmm. know um but that said yeah i i i think that getting up and trying to do something is a lot is you know 60% of the game is showing up right so like intention again i'm going to circle back like if what you're making isn't really uh amazing now but you're trying to make something you're attempting to get better you're in a place in a place in your own process where uh there's room to grow that's obviously forgivable right like we're all trying to get better but um yeah, I, I agree with you. 
that uh, mm -hmm. a lot of what is, you know, I, maybe masquerading is not the right word, but a lot of what's- No, masquerading is right. Art. Okay, a lot of what's masquerading out in the freaking plain open as art is not really, you know, what I would consider art, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, considered um, and carefully executed and really, you know, thoughtful art. <laughs> Okay. All right. So, uh, Mr. Padway, what is beauty in your opinion? Oh, beauty. Beauty is, I think, maybe beauty is what is uh, not art, but beauty, I think, is what stops me sometimes in my tracks and just breaks me out of my own narrative consciousness. So, like, we're all walking around 24 hours a day. Well, no, hopefully we're not walking 24 hours a day. Hopefully we're sleeping and we're eating and we're doing other things. But we're all walking around daily. Um, and we're essentially, like, um, broadcasting in our own heads, right? Like, I've been trying to pay attention lately. Am I thinking in words? Am I thinking in images? It seems to almost always be words. But um, uh, beauty is that thing that stops that process and makes me you know squirrel like it's the uh mm. it's 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 just it's that elusive beautiful okay i can't use beautiful to describe beauty um it's that elusive quality that stops you in your tracks and takes you out of your head and reminds you um that you live in a physical reality um where you are beholden to whatever it is that I think it's probably chemical processes, right? Like at the end of the day, all this is going to be explained by science. Like maybe it's, you know, um, I don't know what, it's clearly not like a painting's not emitting pheromones, right? But like, it can stop you in your tracks the same way that like someone's glance can stop you in your tracks. Um, and we've all experienced it. Um, so I think it's that it's very difficult to kind of pin your to, to pin down with words. Um, but um, yeah, to me, beauty, and it's, I, I hate to be cliche, but it really is kind of in, in the eye of the beholder. Like it could be totally different things for totally different people. Like, um, you know, um, I remember when I took Dan Thompson's Gross Anatomy workshop, I thought that I was going to find it beautiful because I'd seen artwork by guys like Dan and Michael where like, it's just like, it's, they, they find beauty in this thing and they are able to portray that beauty in the thing. But when I, the, the smell was overpowering and the, the actual physicality of being in the room was like, Oh shit. Like this, this is crazy. Like I couldn't, like I, yeah, I wasn't able to tap the beauty um, that they are able to tap. Cause I, I am not a conduit for that kind of beauty. I'm a conduit for a different kind of beauty. So um, yeah, it can be different things to different people. It, it, it has to be different things to different people. Why you does it have it. to be? Because otherwise we're all just basically making Hallmark cards, right? If we all have the same aspirations because we all have the same idea of, of the same ideal, then we're all going to wind up cookie cutter versions of either each other or this big picture. And like, I think it's wonderful that, um, uh, you know, one person is so attracted to Bougereau, they want to paint themselves to look like a 18th century darling. And some people are so attracted to Clive Barker's work that they want to make themselves look like Cenobites, right? Like, so I think that it's, I think it's really, really cool that people find transcendent beauty and ideas and then can make beautiful things from like that to me is a mashup of like drawing because you're a technically super proficient amazing drafts person like you could draw your Thanks. ass off oh no for, yeah i mean this is just plain as day so it's an it's that and it, and it's the idea of cenobites and everything that you know like if you know the history of the movie and you know um that's a different beauty trip like and it's it is beautiful your, your drawing is beautiful but it's so opposite Bougereau and like the 19th century girl in a bonnet that it, it but both are totally valid presentations of beauty so like yeah it, it has to be different for everybody otherwise we're all, we're all going to be Cenobites or we're all going to be Bougereau portraits mm -hmm. right like I think that's one of the yeah. best things I guess I just have uh 
problem, I guess, with the say the saying, you know, I don't know who said that beauty is an eye of the beholder. I think it might have been one of the <laughs> Greeks or something, uh, or whatever. I don't know who it was, but so, I have a problem with it because um first of all, it's not a definition of what beauty is. And no. second of all, well, more than two things, I guess. Second of all, it insinuates that the viewer. So, I mean, what it, what that means, what beauty is an eye of the beholder means is that it depends on who is looking at what, depending on who it is, they're going to find this or that beautiful. One person will find something beautiful and the other, one, the other one will find something else beautiful. Okay. And of course, there's some degree of truth to that, but it is insinu- it's like the saying that insinuates that then that the viewer knows what is beautiful. Okay. Mm. And um, I don't think really very many people know what beautiful what beauty is okay second of all third of all third of all um i think or i have the hypothesis that we confuse or we think we wrongfully think that beauty is about beholding something about looking at something Mm -hmm. and i think that's flawed and I think it's a an inaccurate way of thinking of beauty and trying to understand what it is because I don't think it's about looking at something. Sometimes looking at something or gazing at something or contemplating a work of art or a person or whatever it is, you know, the conduit is the visual aspect of it. Yeah. Meaning you get to the beauty through what you're looking at, but I don't think that's what... I don't think somebody is beautiful because you like how they look. Right. And I mean, I think I think that's where the also other flawed idea of people being like, oh, beauty is like, uh, they're like ached out by it because beauty standards or something. And it's like, um, I think making that relationship is like so short-sighted and juvenile, you know, yeah. in yeah. the sense that it's like, it's like, you know, all cult, not, not only do all cultures have what they find certain things that they find to be beautiful or attractive unique yeah um you know and no not not even necessarily because there are cross-cultural standards of attractive attractiveness and beauty so it's like even right. that is inaccurate but uh, okay so so like so like my hypothesis that i have to say i quite like um is that um beauty is rather s- more like a feeling or a thought process more like what you were saying earlier about how it's something that makes you stop yeah and want to contemplate something and continue contemplating it and just kind of thinking about it and kind of like being with whatever it is and the visual enjoyment is kind of not necessarily a byproduct because it could be kind of like the conduit like the reason for which you stopped you know but i think I think beauty is something that is within the person, like mentally, emotionally, whatever, you know, both. Um, and I think this that aspect of it, or, you know, if that is what beauty is, then I think it's the same for everyone. Because it's like, when you're experience, when a person is experiencing it, however they got to that point, it's like the same thing. It's like, you have to stop and you have to spend time with whatever it is. It's like, you kind of, in a way, have no choice. Because yeah. whatever it is about the experience it's just demanding that you spend more time there thinking about it. And then when you're done, you know, when you have to, you know, you were looking at a flower or a roadkill or something, when you're done looking at it, you keep thinking about it afterwards. Right. You know, so I think, I think that it's like, I have the hypothesis that is universal, just like art, actual art is universal, cross-cultural, cross-time. And I really like the idea of that because everyone gets to experience it the same way, especially Mm. now where it is so in vogue to be like, oh, your hair color is different than mine. So can't relate it, you know? It's like, I am so fucking over that shit. And so it's like, I'm really reveling, uh, just like, you know, enjoying this unifying aspect of these things and kind of really favoring um, those, what I think are aspects or like the true definitions in a way of those things. What do you think about that? Um, first of all, I think it's super interesting because if I'm interview number 80 and you've been asking this question to 80 artists, like 79 other artists, like, and I know the caliber of the artists that. Um, 
Mm. You sound like a robot again. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Still. <laughs> Can't hear you. Can't hear you still. Am I back? Yes, now. Okay. Okay, but now I can't I hear you. you um, oh no. <laughs> I don't know what the hell just happened. Hold on. <laughs> Me either. Um and select the speaker, MacBook Pro speakers. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. okay. Sorry about okay. that. You know what it is That's is that I have my headphones are on the desk and a piece of paper covered them and they went active again. So okay. sorry about that. Um, no worries. So yeah, if 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 you've been asking this question again and again, I feel like you are now an authority, like probably more an authority on this than most. Um, so first of all, yeah, I find what you said super interesting. And I do, I think that there's like, I, I didn't think of it as a two-part process, but there is. There's a first part, which is, and it's often, if maybe even necessarily not voluntary, like I don't think you, like beauty stops you and you go like, whoa, what? Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And if you you can you can like if you have a favorite painting that you find beautiful and you go see it, you can experience some version of beauty every time. But that first time is the showstopper. That's the one that your heart skips a beat, right? So um, that's part one. And I do I think that yes, like to circle back after is an important part of. Um, it's not enough to just stop, and it's not enough to take it in it's to then recognize that you have just had a beautiful experience, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, that's, that's the beginning, the middle and the end. Um, and the, yeah, and that's, that's super rewarding. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that's what I think <laughs> of okay. that. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for indulging in, uh, tell me what you think about the rant that I just oh, went oh. through. Uh, you wait, you said yes. something else that I, I, I just remembered. Um, it reminded me, you know, you were saying that like beauty in the eye of the beholder uh, kind of means or implies that everyone knows or is an authority on beauty, right? Um, it reminded me when I was a night guard at the Met, the most infuriating thing that I've ever heard while I was drawing, um, you know how we all sketch in public and people come sure. and they talk and they, the like the crazy stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, I was it was like 11 o'clock at night and I'm drawing in one of the galleries and one of the supervisors in another section. So not, not, not security. I just want to put that out there. Not security um, came and was like, Oh, what are you drawing? Let me take a look. She goes, Oh, that's very good. And I said, thank you. And she goes, well, I know that's very good. And I go, Oh, thank, thank you. And she goes, I don't draw. I don't paint, I don't do any art, but if I did, I would be very good. So when I tell you that your drawing is good, believe me, I know. And I was just <laughs> like, holy shit, that's the most ignorant thing anyone has ever said, ever. So th that type of person <laughs> does exist. They they are out there and they are actually doing very well. Like they have like 20 people working under them. So, um, and yeah, so, that's scary as hell. Also, I thought of the Twilight Zone. Do you ever watch the Twilight Zone? There's like this uh, one episode. I've seen one or two episodes. There's one where there's like this drop dead gorgeous blonde is like, uh, has all these bandages on her face and you can't see her. And she's like, oh, doctor, doctor, is the surgery a success? Will I be beautiful? Will I be beautiful? And like, it's like, they stretch it out for a half an hour. I mean, it's literally, I can tell you in 10 seconds. Um, and they take the bandages off and she, you see through her eyes, the nurses and the doctors all have like pig faces and they hold the mirror up to her face. And she's like, she looks like Marilyn Monroe. She's a gorgeous blonde, but because she doesn't fit the pig face scenario, she thinks she's horribly ugly. And it's kind of pounds home this message that like, yes, like this stuff is totally superficial. What we take as like, you know, uh, we're, we're culturally programmed to find certain things more significant than they really are and other things less significant than they really are. So yeah, I think everything you said is spot on. That, that's all. Okay. Uh, all right. So we've broken past the hour long mark of this conversation, oh, Mr. Okay. Padway. So I'm going to start to close it out. Is there anything you want to add? Um, is there, what are you working on these days? Do you have any classes coming up? Do you have any shows coming up? What are you excited about? Where can your work be found? Um, 
I'm excited about Silverpoint at the moment, and I've been working in Silverpoint for like a solid year, almost exclusively. Um, I've just finished my second Silverpoint workshop at the Art Students League in New York City. We're going to do another one in the fall. Uh, I don't have a date yet, but um, you're going to teach. Yeah, teach nice. teaching, and well, so teaching the workshops. Also, I've been uh filling in at the art students league like thank god right when i needed it they came through with a bunch of substitute teaching so i've been substitute teaching um you'll, you might see me in the uh, cast drawing class in studio one and two in the life drawing um figure drawing which to me is life drawing but anyway it was a different yeah. class um so yeah i've been substitute teaching at the art students league in the studio classes and i'm doing workshops in silver point and working in silver point and yeah i currently in a show out in Long Island at the Massive Pequot, I think it is. Oh God, if it's not, I, I'm sorry. Uh, library <laughs> in Long Island. Um, and it's, yeah, that's that's about where I'm at. Um, you can find me teaching in Manhattan, essentially. Okay. All right. Well, um, all right. Well, thank you everyone for watching and listening. Special thanks to my guest, Phil, for agreeing to talk to me and for his time. If you'd like to support Phil, my podcast, myself, or all three, corresponding the corresponding links will be in the caption. Make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know you were here with us. And also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel. So uh, thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye.